So I'm really excited to have Timor Sechin with us tonight, um, slowly becoming a good friend and um, yeah, uh, curated him uh, in a show recently uh, in the summer of 22, actually at Hesse Plateau with um, this fabulous curating collective that Andrew Woolbright was kind of the main, the main, the main lion tamer on that show, but uh, we work as a collective um, and it was at Hesse Plateau and Timor's piece was amazing. Um, he's based in Berlin, as we said, and New York. Um, and as you read of German and Mongolian Chinese descent, which often comes into his work. And uh, so Timor Sichin's uh, selected solo exhibitions include Basin of Attraction at the Bonner Kunstverein in Bonn, Infinite Surrender, Focused Control at Societe in Berlin in 2013, Legend at Fluxia in Milan in 2011. Um, selected group shows include, and this is just a few, there's so many, uh, The Great Acceleration at the Taipei Biennial, uh, Meta Rave, It's Only a Fantasy at Walrus Art Space in Freiburg, Economie der Aufmerksamkeit at Kunsthalle Wien, um, Art Post Internet at the Ulan Center for Contemporary Art in Beijing, Speculations on Anonymous Materials at the, I can never say this, the Friedericineum in Kassel, you can correct. How do you say it? You know to... Yeah. Thank you. That's so <laughs> hard to tongue, say. Tongue twister. Yeah. A material world at PSM in Berlin. Performance anxiety at Stadium in New York. Take Me, I Love You at Von Ammon uh, Company in Washington, D.C. Um, as well as the group show I mentioned at Hesse Flateau. And most recently, a commissioned work called Sacred Footprint, commissioned by none other than Meta, as well as an upcoming exhibition that he's been working on recently, madly, since it's at the end of this month, at, again, at his gallery, the Societe in Berlin, called Natural Origin. And I just want to say Timur's work is really wide ranging, using the conceptual frameworks of commercial branding, rabid critiques of destructive national discourses uh, um, about the environment uh, and projects that try to lay a blueprint for contemporary spiritual renewal in really cool ways. Please welcome Timor Sechin. Yay. Thanks for coming and being here. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Cash, for having me. It's it's always a pleasure. Um, like, uh, like was mentioned, it's one here, and I'm, I've been trying to drink a lot of green tea to stay up, but uh, I think my brain is not quite at 100%, so if I stumble over my words a little bit, I'll know why. Um, I, <clears throat> I'm sharing a lecture that, um, that Cash has, is already familiar with. Um, it's kind of my... Uh, the place that I got to maybe a year ago in my uh, conceptual practice. And then since then I've been a bit too busy uh, working on sculptures and, and making objects, but I, I'm hoping that after this summer that I can jump back into that, that stuff and, and keep developing and, and, um, and keep writing and maybe uh, finish this, the second part of, of the heavenistic uh, text. Um, but uh, I'm yeah, I'm hoping for most of you guys this will be pretty new. So let me pull up my keynote. Okay, so just to start off a little bit about myself, um, I was born in Berlin in 1984. Uh, this is me and my grandma in West Berlin on the west side of the wall. And uh, my grandma is uh, from Mongolia originally, but she lives in, in China. And my, my dad was born there and my dad's side of the family, they all live in China. And, um, and uh, at some point my mom remarried and she married an Apache Native American man who was my stepdad. Uh, and we moved to Arizona and I grew up there. And uh, I grew up in this, uh, in in a Native American sort of ceremonial context, we were uh, kind of connected to the San Carlos Apache Reservation in Arizona, and 
and we would go there often. And, and I grew up in Tucson. Uh, this is me and my grandma in, in Berlin. This is us in, at Tiananmen Square. Um, and uh, yeah, my so my my father lives in in Beijing, and uh, my father's side of the family does. And then my uh, mom remarried uh, at some point, and I uh, to my Native American uh, stepfather, and we moved to Arizona, and I grew up there. Um, this is a photo of the sweat lodge, which was in our in our backyard. And um, and I was fortunate enough to be to grow up in this Native American ceremonial context, and we would travel to different reservations and and uh, attend different dances and ceremonies throughout the Southwest. Um, this is an Apache crown dance, which is a really cool uh, and very kind of alien uh, dance. And <clears throat> so, growing up in Arizona. You know, I, I also grew up a lot around uh, conservative or fundamentalist Christians. And um, and the, the difference between these two cultures always really struck me because they were, you know, in the same places, but it was really kind of a 180 from one another, especially when it came to uh, how they treated nature, how they thought about nature. And... Um, and basically, you know, you can come to this conclusion that that uh, you know this um, European ancestry culture really is engaged in a war on nature, and um, as opposed to you know Native American or indigenous cultures where nature is sort of like the center of their spirituality, and you know why this was was always quite a mystery to me and it got me you know thinking and and researching uh, and thinking about the causes of why um, you know why this difference arose in the first place and it got me thinking about the differences between um, you know foraging cultures versus sedentary agrarian cultures and um and so if you think about agricultural societies, you know, historically, you know, farming led to the, the idea of private ownership of nature. Uh, food surpluses led to class stratification. Um, it's likely that domesticated animals led to gender stratification uh, or the use of domesticated animals. And um, and these agricultural societies tend to have tended to have these human centered religions where there was, you know, uh, a pharaoh or a king who was in direct communication with God. Um, and as opposed to, you know, hunter gatherer cultures, um, first, the small group size means that they tend to be more egalitarian. Um, they tend to be more. Uh, gender balanced as well, and they uh, tend to have an eco an awareness of their their place in in an ecological system, and nature tends to be at the center of their uh, religions, and especially the the idea of re reciprocity with nature. And so, you know, if you think about it. Um, you can think of religions as a kind of technology um, and they're technologies for adaptive behavior for specific historical environments and, and uh, circumstances. And, and um, so you can think of religions as these meaning systems that produce uh, adaptive behavior at the scale of groups. And they do things like align goals and values and beliefs. And um, um, and they do this, you know, by harnessing spiritual emotionality. And, you know, just like any technology, there are certain kind of, kind of biases that can be uh, programmed in. And so with the Abrahamic 
um, cultures, um, there's this bias against materials and, and the material world and matter. And so, you know, in, in the Bible, um, matter is depicted as being innately uh, lifeless and without form. And it's only through, you know, the, the touch of God that uh, vitality and life is given uh, to, to the material world. And, um, and there's different, you know, kind of facets of this and different lineages. And, you know, some comes from Greece and some comes from uh, the Middle East, uh, et cetera. Um, but all of this, you know, kind of crystallizes eventually historically in this um, anthropodualism or this, this, uh, this fundamental, you know, separation between humans and, and nature that, that in Western culture, you know, is so deeply embedded. So, you know, this dualism between nature and culture, biology versus technology, uh, mind versus body, uh, matter versus spirit or consciousness or subject versus object. And, you know, this, and it leads to this, this metaphor of nature as a machine, as, as just an object that can be manipulated. Um, and that has no, you know, living force within it. But, you know, actually, um, and what, what we've found out now through science is that, um, you know, matter is actually innately uh, living. It's innately dynamic. It's irreducible and emergent. It's self-organizing. It's contingent. And, um, and there's just something, you know, very uh autonomous and uh vital about material reality um but you know this dualism is is so deeply embedded in our western language and value system um that you know uh being materialistic is uh you know a pejorative and it's it has a bad connotation and and I think that this comes from this, you know, Christian idea of being in the world, but not of the world that, you know, you're, it's only your soul that is good and, and your body and, and the rest of life is just uh, temptation and, and um, sin and that you have to, you know, um, uh, keep your spirit and your soul clear, clean of that. But you know, today we we face these these massive material problems, and you know some of them are not easily detectable either. They're uh, you know they're statistical, and you, you know you have to dig through the science, and um, and for that reason, you know I think that it it sets us up in a bad place that we we have a hard time um confronting these material problems such as climate change and so the argument can be made that you know this culture this original culture which is uh, an agricultural uh culture and and maybe even specifically you know a um a uh uh, sorry, <laughs> I'm just going to skip. Um, you can make the you can make the argument that they've become maladaptive today; that they they no longer fit our contemporary environmental challenges. And um, and this is you know going into how Christian nationalism in, in the U.S. is you know such a big force, and it's not something that's easily talked about, uh, and their relationship to nature and extraction. Um, and I think it's, you know, set in a larger kind of truth crisis where we have, that we have today, uh, where we have an eroded trust in science and climate change, uh, denial, anti-vaccine, uh, fake news, et cetera. But, this, you know, this anthropocentrism is also detectable in, in 
uh, even in critical theory, you know, we still operate from this subject object dualism, um, which we inherit via a legacy of psychoanalysis and phenomenology. And, you know, these, these narratives privilege uh, the human subject versus not the non-human. Um, and, um, um, you know, a lot of these discourses were sort of summed up in this term correlationism, uh, which was then, uh, which was then critiqued in, sorry, I'm trying to move this window so I can see. This. <laughs> uh, sorry. So, so there was a term a few years ago that came up in um, in philosophy, in contemporary philosophy, uh, under the um, uh, under the discourse of speculative realism. That's one term for it, or new materialism, and um, and what they critiqued was this idea of correlationism. And correlationism is sort of this catch-all term for uh, the phenom phenomenological or basically any discourse that says that, you know, everything that we know about the world is only, is, is ever only correlated to our own subjectivity as humans. And so we can't say anything about the world other than, uh, you know, what it's like to be human. But the problem is with that is that it really, you know, discounts uh, the experiences of animals and, and, plants and you know, non-human actors. Um, and this is a great quote by Levi Bryant. Um, the problem with correlationism is not that it drew attention to the relationship between thought and being humans in the world, but that in doing so, it had a tendency to reduce other beings to what they are for us. Correlationism's questions always seem to be, what are things for us? How do the beings of the world reflect us? Um, and so there, there are, you know, contemporary strains in philosophy, such as new materialism, speculative realism, uh, xenofeminism, uh, object-oriented ontology, and, and later Latour. And, um, you know, all of these are quite diverse, uh, but they tend to have one thing in common, which is uh, this idea of a flat ontology, this idea that all of the beings and all of the things in the world are on the same ontological level. You know, it's not that humans are on top and everything else is below us, but we're just one animal about, amongst many. And, you know, this was philosophy that I, I was really interested in some years ago. Um, and it was then only a couple of years later that I that I realized that the reason that I was drawn to it was that it really uh, reflected what I had already learned in, in Native American or indigenous uh, worldview. And that this was really, you know, Western European philosophy sort of approaching what indigenous people were sort of thinking already for a long time. Um, so, you know, in an indigenous conception, you know, the world already they already have a flat ontology um, and which made them sensitive to you know, ecological destruction. And they understand the world is made out of relatives rather than resources. And they understand that the material world is sacred. And um, here you can see, uh, this is uh, the term metakiasin, which is like the thing that you say after every prayer in, in Lakota. And um, it's kind of like an amen, um, but it, the translation is all my relations. And so, you know, that's the central, that's the central part of, of their spirituality, the idea that they're related to everybody, um, you know, which is, it stands in contrast to, you know, the, the Christian idea of like worshiping a, a, guy, a guy that's out there. Um, 
And, uh, you know, so coming back to this idea that, you know, religions um, are sort of technologies that, that shape human behavior and that they're, they're technologies for addressing environmental conditions. Um, then today, you know, applying that idea to the, to the contemporary and, and the, the, the environmental challenges that we face today, you know, it's kind of, it's interesting to think that, you know, per, we already sort of have this mechanism in, in human nature that, that uh, allows us to all kind of get on the same page and, and address the same uh, problems. And, uh, and so perhaps, you know, it's, we need to tap into this kind of mechanism again. Uh, and so, so, you know, I think that really what's, what's necessary today is, uh, is to articulate a new kind of spirituality uh, of symbiosis. And, and I think that in some ways, you know, contemporary art is already sort of evolving in that direction. Um, you know, it's already sort of a secular religion today uh, in that, um, you know, it, it, <clears throat> it creates uh, emotional, spiritual, emotional reactions in people, you know, at its best. Um, and, you know, it has a whole a way of engaging in rituals and it has its places of worship. Um, it broadcasts its morality in a very strong way and defines a moral community. And, um, and I think what makes it suitable for the contemporary is that, you know, it really celebrates difference and diversity uh, at its best, you know, at its, um, and so when it comes to my own practice, um, I, you know, I had, uh, some years when I was, before I was, you know, very specifically interested in, in, in spirituality. Um, I was researching a lot about just branding and, and why, why it is that, uh, you know, branding affects human cognition as, as much as it does. And, um, and then around 2016 or something, I kind of combined those interests and, um, uh, I should actually say that, uh, you know, one aspect of a branding that I found really interesting was, was to think of a brand as a sort of a sculpture in itself. It's sort of a virtual object that exists and, and that can, you know, express itself in, in different material forms. Uh, over time and kind of can mutate itself as well. And so it's a kind of container and it's a kind of an, a sculpture and it, and it interacts with the brain in very specific ways. Um, so anyway, you know, bringing those, those, those ideas together, uh, I, I developed this idea, this brand of new piece, which is sort of trying to encapsulate uh, and articulate this kind of narrative of a of a new spirituality. Um, and so, yes, the new piece was born, and um, you know, it's a rejection of the old dualisms, uh, and it's it's ultimately, I think, a, a mimetic machine for addressing climate change. Um, there are very specific sort of uh, sub subtopics for new piece. Um, so one of them is the undivided ground, which is basically the idea of imminence, uh, and it's a celebration of the divinity of the ontological whole, which we kind of already went over. Um, the second one is called faith and pattern, and so it's. The idea is that, you know, you know, faith, the idea of faith, uh, you know, I think it can be retooled and, um, you know, faith usually is like that you have faith that something specific is going to happen. That's one sense of it. Or, and then the other, the other sense of it is that 
you know, you have faith that everything ultimately has meaning. And so I think we can hold on to the meaning part of it. And, um, and I think it can be uh, remapped onto the idea of uh, morphogenesis, which is the idea that, you know, there's an emergent patterning that happens at all scales of reality. Uh, and, and so there's this, you know, divinely beautiful pattern that happens um, and, you know, no matter what happens in, in our own lives, um, we, we can just be, uh, sure that, you know, it's part of some larger pattern, even if that pattern is, you know, a physical pattern. Um, the third one is called pray to scale. And so it, it's about how, you know, there's this sort of innate sense of spirituality that anybody can access just by thinking about scale you know if you think about like if you look at the stars and you think about how big the universe is or how long it took the light to get to to your eyes how, how you know how old the universe is how, how old time is or even you know when you, if you look at the very small you know just contemplating these these scales uh, I think is innately spiritual. And, um, and so I think that that's just like identifying that as a, as an innate source of spirituality that, you know, is not tied to any specific religion that, that anybody can access. Um, and then the last one is purpose from difference, which is, um, you know, recognizing that, uh, that the universe is progressively differentiating. You know, we we started off potentially with you know just a lot of helium and hydrogen uh, at the beginning of the universe, and then that slowly evolved and differentiated into you know all of the diversity that we have today, um, all of our you know biological diversity, cultural diversity, intellectual. Uh, technological diversity. Um, and so maybe it's it's the creation of difference and diversity itself that's the point of, of reality of, of the universe. And maybe you know that's where our, our how our values should be mapped as well. It's is to uh, value diversity, value biodiversity, value cultural diversity. Um, Oh yeah, so here's a bit about the branding stuff, but if you guys have questions, we can just go come back to that. Um, and uh, here are just some images of my my work. Uh, these are <clears throat> these are some some trees that I scanned in the aftermath of the, of a forest fire in California. Um, here they are in the high line. And this is in Beijing. And um, this is a tree that I scanned uh, at um, Jojo Keith's Ranch in New Mexico. And so this is um, part of a, a series of, of sculptures that I've been doing and then I'm continuing now, which is a lot of these 3D scanned trees and they're 3D printed. Um, And um, <clears throat> uh, let's see. Yeah, and if you guys have questions for these, we can then come back to them later. Uh, I made a VR piece. Uh, I know Cash uh, suggested that we will watch a clip of that. We can do that afterwards. Um, and um, <clears throat> yeah, so so the series of trees, you know, I think for me, I see the tree as sort of um, a potential like symbol, spiritual symbol of of the post Anthropocene. Um, and it was perhaps, uh, you know, a, 
a symbol of uh, free Christendom. Um, this is a show in, in DC. Sorry, I'll just don't come back to that after the slides. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, so the trees are made of metal, right? <clears throat> uh, they're diff they're different. I mean, usually most of them are three D printed in PLA, and then there's just one that I've made in metal. Or no, a couple of them I've made in metal. How do you like get that texture like part of your process? Like I feel like it looks so realistic almost. Yeah, they're I mean they're three D scanned with photogrammetry and then 3D printed. And so, you know, as long as the scan is uh accurate and high quality, then then you can capture all that. Do you like uh, paint texture. them? Yeah, and then they're hand painted. This is the real tree. That's this one. Where, where is where is the tree like in the world? Where where is that? This is in Peru. Ah, yeah. Thank you. In, in, in the Amazon. And then this is the the piece I made for Meta for the um, for their headquarters in Manhattan, the new building. And these are most of the trees that I scanned uh, upstate in New York. And this is all stainless steel up here, all the leaves and everything. Yeah, so this is it. Did I get it? Did I use up enough time? Yeah, but let's show that uh, video, can we, of New Piece from the VR? Sure. Awesome, because we just did a whole VR section. So it'd be great for them to see this. Can you hear it? Yeah. Life on this planet stands at the cusp of a great threshold. As we awaken for the first time to the full scale of space and time, we awaken also to our own capacities for altering our planet and ourselves. There have been 10,000 generations of families since the emergence of our species, but the generations currently alive will witness the greatest changes in the shortest amount of time. Changes to our environments, our societies, and our bodies. Our old agrarian mythologies and religions are ill-equipped to deal with the pace and scale of these changes, and are no longer able to provide a sense of meaning or direction. Now, more than ever, do we need to construct new myths and express a new sense of spirituality? A spiritual relationship with the universe of pattern, matter, and energy we call home. The religious impulse most likely arose before the speciation of Homo sapiens. 
evidence of the intentional burial of the deceased arguably dates as far back as 400,000 years ago. Intentional burials reveal the beginnings of a mindfulness of mortality and perhaps a salience of the afterlife. With the widespread adoption of agriculture, large-scale societies emerged and along with them, organized religions. Religion provided justification to central authorities and institutions to levy taxes and organize labor, and to forge alliances among unrelated individuals as opposed to the family clan divisions that had been typical of hunter-gatherer societies. Religions and beliefs have always been forms of technologies, protocols for social and environmental interactions and norms. But today, as the world enters a new era of accelerating changes, these ancient protocols, adaptations for agricultural societies, no longer serve us and in fact, imperil life on this planet. The Abrahamic religions adhere to a strict dualism wherein material existence is inherently evil and true goodness can only be found in the afterlife. According to them, matter is an innately lifeless and sinful mass onto which only God can imbue form and life. This dualism, in which humans and culture are categorically distinct from that which is nature, has left us disenchanted and removed from the world. The dualistic bias blinds us to the true nature of matter as dynamic, self-organizing, and imbued with morphogenic potentiality. It impedes our understanding of the world's systemic nature and renders us insensitive to its dynamics and well-being. What can be a real source for the spiritual today? How can we avoid the dread of a mechanistic nihilism in a secular age? Can there be a true source of the spiritual beyond the contingent being of the human? New peace is a vessel, a container for a new synthesis of ideas about our reality a toolkit for building new myths and meanings for a world undergoing profound changes. One that is able to utilize the natural propensity of humans towards spiritual thought, emotion, and energy without sacrificing the indispensable contemporary tools of science, falsification, and criticality. New peace is a new protocol to understanding one's place in the vastness of time and space. A radically inclusive, secular faith of the real. A mysticism for the Anthropocene that fosters a spiritual relationship to matter itself. No divine beings, transcendent realms, or eternal essences necessary only the true infinite creativity of matter and energy on the imminent plane. Everything that exists, exists as part of the one whole, undivided ground of matter, energy, and information. Our universe of infinite creativity is sacred and mysterious in and of itself. The perceived barriers between mind and body, subject and object, spiritual and material, are illusions of temporal scale. Without permanence, there is only the perpetually changing totality of the infinite whole. Through the evolution of the cosmos, we are the story of matter being told to itself in infinite permutations. Matter undergoes constant change. 
Life is an expression of matter's capacity for difference. Difference makes life possible and worth living. These truths lay the foundation for a new ethics beyond the narrow subject of the human. Uniting all ethical impulses is the drive to maximize the diversity of possible futures. Difference is freedom, the fruit of this pattern, matter, and energy universe. Matter inherently shapes itself into the exquisite forms and patterns observable at all scales of reality. New peace seeks to introduce a new understanding of faith based on the inherent capacity for matter to organize and grow itself into the divinely aesthetic and diverse patterns of our universe. A faith in morphogenesis. In one sense, faith is a blind adherence to an arbitrary religious belief, be it in God, or heaven, or the fulfillment of a prophecy. In another sense, faith gives people hope of a guiding principle and meaning underneath the chaos of the world and within their lives. A contemporary understanding of matter reveals that reality may be chaotic but it is also deeply and subtly patterned. Morphogenesis is the development and differentiation of form inherent to life, matter, and information itself. After recognizing that the miraculous process of growth and living pattern operates at all scales of our world, it is no blind leap of faith that the pattern exists in one's own life as well. Though we may not be able to predict the pattern, we can have faith that the subtlety and beauty of the patterns in which we are embedded are inescapable. <clears throat> so this is a, uh, uh, a 2D video version of the VR piece, which is basically the same thing. And you start off uh, by this campfire, and then you sort of float up this mountain. And um, uh, yeah, and the only difference is that it's like 360, but there's no interact interactivity or anything like that um, and I made it in 2018 and uh, yeah I hope to make a new VR piece this year actually cool Really great, really beautiful. Thank you, I thought it was so great to show that at the end too. <laughs>